On a Tuesday, no different than this one or that, all the Cliff Notes employees, they sat and they sat and they twiddled and fiddled and biddled away all the tedious minutes that crawled through the day. No customers came, no shoppers to look, and no one online even ordered a book. So the boys were all bored. Oh, how bored were they all. For an hour, Dan sat and he stared at the wall. And EGB reorganized paperbacks, putting good ones and bad ones in separate stacks. And Gomez, poor fellow, ate all of his snacks. Not a crumb of potato chip left in his sacks. Look at this, said poor Gomez, depressed by the dearth. I have eaten so much it will triple my girth and I'm still fucking hungry. Come on, you're just bored. Gomez, don't you have an emergency hoard? You're right, Gomez said. It is under the counter. And so in between Dan's legs he dove like a flounder and pulled out from under a sack of old stuff a five-year-old marshmallow cream-filled fluff. Any shipments today? EGB asked his boss. No. Hey, Gomez, don't eat that flabba for your toss. Then at least EGB will have something to do. If I puke on the floor, he can clean up my spew. Then EGB said, Look, there's chicks making out. And he pointed outside and Gomez whirled about and EGB yoinked the flabba from his grip and he opened the wrapper with one mighty rip. My flabba! Gomez cried. Do you see? Do you see? EGB has purloined my last munchie from me! I have asked and have asked till my asking bones ache. I have made all appeals that a person can make that this great churlish booby, this impudent jerk, use a soup song of courtesy while we're at work. But since Gomez insists on this daily rebuff, I shall teach him a lesson and eat his flabuff. Then without a moment's reflection or pause, he stuffed that flabuff right up into his jaws, and he chewed and he chewed with a slurpy smack sound, and in three mighty gulps he had swallowed it down. I will pay you for that! I will pay you in spades! I will pay you with knuckles and pay you with blades. I will crush your small bones with a bone-crushing post and mix them with honey and eat it on toast. Chill out, said the ass manager. He was right. You were being a dick, Gomez. Give up the fight and stop making your idle cannibal threats or I'll schedule you both for a sit-down with Chet. My threats are not idle, not even a bit. This provender pilferer's gonna get hit. It may not be now, but at some future date, you're gonna get yours, Mr. Bankhead. Just wait. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. A Gomez is vengeful, 100%! And then Dan sat back down with an unconcerned shrug, and then Gomez sulked back to his laptop and plugged in his headphones and listened to Bat Out of Hell while Dan played with his nipples and EGB fell asleep on a volume of Marquis de Sade, and Dan looked at the clock and said, Merciful God! If somebody does not walk in that door soon, be it customer, robber, or rabid baboon, I am closing this store and then grocery shopping, and after that, possibly titty bar hopping. But just as Dan almost had made up his mind to invite Gomez out to ye old flash and grind and to tell EGB to go home for the day and to telephone Candace and tell her to stay at home for her shift did not start until two, then all of a sudden and out of the blue, Candace came in the store and so Dan said, You're early. Yes, I know. Dan, I'd like you to meet my friend Curly. Like the stooge? Queried Dan. Then he wished he had not, but the lady did not seem to mind it a lot. Still, Dan shook his head and said, I'm really sorry. EGB in his sleep shouted, Alpha Centauri. Ignoring this, Daniel extended his hand and he said, It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Dan. Then said Candace's friend with a smile full of grace, My name is Carlina Persimmon McFace. And I told her, said Candace, that you'd take a look and that you might consider us selling her book. Oh, you've written a book? Well, that's super, my dear, for this is a bookstore and we sell them here. Long books and short books and big books and small. Books by Ken Kesey and books by Roald Dahl. Shakespeare and Kerouac, Tolkien and Bloom, Homer and Hemingway, Herbert and Hume. Books about cooking and how to breastfeed. Books about politics. Books about weed. Books about doing it, graphic and chaste. Books for all people, whatever their taste. So what is the name of the book you have written? It's called Happy Sad Mad, The Bipolar Kitten. And it teaches young children how everyone has someone that they love that is kind of a spaz. And it's probably better to try and abstain from screaming at them, Mom, you're bad shit insane! Because you might hurt their feelings. You might make them cry. And they might take a fork and stab you in the eye. Well, that sounds fantastical, Curly McFace. I'm sure we can find you some shelfular space. 
Now, E.G.B. Bankhead, who'd been on the floor and hoping to snooze just a little bit more, prepared to say something unpleasant and rude to these non-customers who had dared to intrude on his snoozy time. But then he saw Curly, and he found her a rather desirable girly. And though E.G.B. had the sociable skill of a sleep-deprived monkey that's mentally ill, he fancied himself quite the likable wit, and so he stepped forward intending to hit on this lovely young author. But Flirt, he did not. He just stopped, like his feet had been glued to the spot. And he got a bit pale, and his breathing slowed down. And he made a strange face like a drunk hobo clown, for he felt a strong pain in the pit of his belly that rolled and that writhed like a stripper named Kelly was doing a bad coked-out dance of the veils with spiky heels on inside his entrails. Now it may have been because his pants were too tight, or because he had gas from those tacos last night. But I think that it was the flabuff that he ate was thirty-six months past its eat-me-by date. And it pains me to say, oh, I say with a frown, a flabuff that has spoiled will just never stay down. Bad flabuffs have their fun not long after they're munched with a game that I call up, up, up with the lunch. So when EGB opened his trap up to speak, it wasn't kind words that came out of his beak, but a torrent of upchuck, a great mighty spray of everything he had eaten that day. And oh, how it flowed, how the belly soup flowed, why they seemed nearly endless, those chunks that he blowed. And although the others, like aides to a vet or the script supervisor on a porno set, might have been splattered with some little trace, the bulk of it went on Kerlina McFace. Now, in order that you won't be over-perplexed at the chain of events that shall come about next, we must take a quick gander outside of the shop where the corporate Chet, drinking grape soda pop, was strolling along planning to take a peek in his store as he typically did once a week, while just a few hundred more yards behind him, a scruffy bohemian, lanky and slim, who smelled of nag champa and yogurt and grass, was riding his bicycle to his art class. And as the lad cycled and corporate strolled, neither could guess what would shortly unfold. Back inside, EGB was now just about done disencumbering his stomach for everyone. And though nobody present was overly thrilled, it was on to poor Curly that EGB spilled. So Curly's reaction, as one might well guess, was a bit more dramatic and strong than the rest. She flapped both her hands, and she did a small dance, like a child who's about to make wee in her pants. And she whimpered and slowly backed up to the door, and she turned around thrice, and she ran out the store. Now just at this time, on the sidewalk outside, Corporate and the bike were about to collide. So loudly, the cycling boho yelled, hey. and Corporate stepped awkwardly out of the way. It was then that poor Curly ran out of the shop, but the cyclist saw that he just couldn't stop, and so, cursing both fate and inertia alike, he plowed into Curly McFace with his bike. Then up over the bike and the boy Curly flew, tumbling through the air like a tumbling tumboo, and she landed face first like a blind legless bird right on top of Chet Finnegan Thomas the Third. But she hadn't been hurt, so she leapt to her feet and hysterical ran, waving her arms down the street. Do you want to go after her? Daniel inquired. She gets this way sometimes, but soon she'll get tired and make her way back to the store. Then we'll leave. Now I'm going to go wipe this puke off my sleeve. Then Corporate pulled himself up off the ground, and guessing that all at Cliff Notes was not sound, he stepped around Dan and looked in through the door, and he saw all the mess on the floor of his store. And he saw EGB looking thoroughly rotten, and Gomez beaming with Freuda that was shodden. And with fury that he could just barely contain, he stared Dan in the eye and said simply, Explain. And Dan tried to think of just what he could say, just how to describe all that happened that day. But what could Dan say to him? What could he do? Well, what would you do if your corporate asked you?